Father, you are truly great. You're powerful. You're God and you're our loving Father. And because you're the God of the Exodus, you're also the God who rescues brutalized people. And we're mindful again this morning, they exist in our world. And we pray that you would rescue them now. Any hostage, any captive, anyone trapped anywhere near and far, trapped by a dangerous person, trapped by an addiction, trapped by fear or terror, trapped in a relational conflict, you're the God who redeems and liberates, and we pray that you would. We're, we're gathering all our prayers together. We're praying together. We're praying that you would work great works of rescue wherever they need to be. And we love you, and we're grateful to be together, and we're grateful for the hope that we have, and we're grateful that you're great. And we pray in Christ, in whom we see you, Father. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Oh, welcome to Hillside. Very, very, very good to see you. And uh, if you're new, I think there may be some new people here today. We are, we're just delighted that you have come into the room today. Uh, a couple of months ago, a good friend of mine sent me this picture. I think it's going to pop up. There it is. And some of you will actually know the people uh, in this picture, at least the ones on the sides. Uh, on the left is Dave Singh who longtime Hillside leader serves in our men's ministry team right now. He was the one who sent the pic to me. And on the right are Hillsiders Sharon Singh, Dave Stewart, and Doug Stern. We'll be hearing from Doug uh, in the annual meeting in a little while. And they are all whooping it up at uh, a wedding reception. I think it was in Alamo. Well, the guy in the middle who officiated the wedding that they're all uh, celebrating at is Peter Nittler and his wife, Katie. Well, who are they, you're wondering. Uh, Peter is both my close friend and my successor as college pastor at First Baptist Church of Davis. And I am basically here at Hillside today because the ultra-talented, and the ultra charismatic Peter Nittler, all right? Um, first my student, he was a student who grew up in the ministry, and then he went to seminary, then he was my pastoral protege, okay? Eventually beat me out of the starting job back in Davis, and that's why I'm here today, not really. Uh, but he is a great friend and a really wonderful pastor. And anyway, in his text, uh, Dave Singh told me that when they made this connection, the Hillside uh, Davis connection, uh, Peter cracked them all up uh, by doing an impression of me. And um, I have heard about this impression over the years, and I've known that Peter sometimes rolls it out in groups of people who know us both, though coincidentally never when I'm around, uh, he does this. But there was one exception. At my goodbye lunch at FBC three years ago, Peter was the MC, and he busts out a few bars of his Dan imitation, uh, eliciting hearty laughter among the guests at this party. Now, I laughed too, and the truth was I, was I was flattered by it. I enjoyed every second of it. But at the moment, I thought, that is not me. <laughs> That is not me at all. I don't speak with those inflections. I don't have those mannerisms. That's not me at all. But after about five seconds, the penny dropped. And I thought, of course it's me. Otherwise, all these people here wouldn't be rolling on the ground laughing. Uh, and it reminded me that I don't know myself as well as I think I do. In fact, the truth is none of us know ourselves quite as well as we think we do. But why tell you that story? Because self-knowledge, self-awareness plays a big part in the teaching that Jesus gives us this morning. And you're gonna see what I mean in just a minute. So uh, before we get there, let's get our bearings, maybe for somebody who's new. Today, believe it or not, we reach week 11 of our fall message series from the Sermon on the Mount called The Flourishing Trees. And if you've been here, you know that the big idea of the series has been this, flourishing through wholeness and wholeness 
through Jesus the King inside us, teaching and tutoring. That's the whole series in 12 words. And I want to thank my friend David Spanny in the back for tightening up that summary a little bit. Very, very helpful. This series has been about flourishing. Flourishing in the here and now. Experiencing practical benefit in our lives in the here and now. And specifically through wholeness or teleos, one of our two Greek words for this series. And wholeness meaning something very particular. Outer lives, words, reactions, uh, decisions that are the spillover that, that flow naturally from a, a deep inner goodness, a transformed heart, goodness that Jesus grows in us after we are reconciled to him in faith, goodness that he grows in us as we abide in him, as, as we live in him as his friends and as we live with each other as fellow disciples. And you know how great it is that Jesus works on us in our depths, at the deepest place in us, not just uh, behavioral stuff, but Jesus changes us deep within and the overflow of that is a brand new life. A few years ago, uh, my twin brother, Darren and I took my mom to the San Francisco Art, Asian Art Museum uh, for her birthday. We went, went to lunch, went to the museum, really cool place. And anyway, up near the ceiling of the grand staircase, and if you've been there, uh, you know this really spectacular stone staircase with columns and everything. Up at the top is an inscription that reads this way, character is the governing element of life and is above genius. And I took a picture of it. And I had a hard time finding a picture this week. Couldn't quite remember the exact wording of the, of the inscription, so I called the museum <laughs> and, uh, and they confirmed it for me. And then I found the picture. But I enjoyed the art that day. I thought it was pretty tremendous. But I tell you, it was that inscription that stuck with me. I've never forgotten it. Character is the governing element of life and is above genius. That's a New Testament idea. And what it's saying is that far more than what's outside us, far more than the forces that, that are uh, coming at us, impinging upon us, far more than those things, it's what's inside us. It's our character, it's how we respond to those challenges that shapes our destiny. And, and, and what a gift then that King Jesus works on us at the level of our hearts. He works on us at the level of our character so that at the, at the end of our lives, whether it's 90 years or 30 years or whatever, we can come to the end knowing we lived a productive life. We've lived well and we have no regrets. All right, let's look at the passage. It's Matthew 7, 1 through 6. Very, very interesting. It's gonna take some time to unpack. Let's read it. It goes this way. Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Now this is pretty famous teaching, isn't it? We have heard this before. And in fact, I think uh, if you were to poll non-church people, you're just going to a bunch of non-church people uh, in the park and, and you were to ask them, uh, to tell you Jesus' teaching that they're sort of familiar with, I bet a lot of people would bust out some version of Matthew 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. A lot of people, uh, even in our post-Christian culture, are familiar with this little bit of teaching. And it's not hard to imagine why this little nugget uh, would be so popular among people outside the church and actually people inside the church as well. Because on its face, you just kind of take it at face value, it sounds like Jesus is issuing a universal judgment on judgment, doesn't it? Because it sounds like what he's saying. 
on his face. Sounds like he's making a condemnation of all condemnation. And that can be kind of convenient for us, right? If maybe there's something about our lives or our habits uh, that we don't want anybody else uh, talking about. And like some of you, I bet, uh, I love to read the reader comments uh, for news stories. And I've noticed that oftentimes uh, in stories that involve Christians uh, taking positions on, on you know, dicey social issues, there will often be in the list of comments, a comment kind of like this one. I bet you can relate if you read reader comments on news stories, something like this. Why are you Christians casting judgment? Didn't Jesus himself say, judge not, that you be not judged? You should listen to him and keep your private beliefs to yourselves. You can imagine that. You read that quite often. And at first blush, you know, seems like commentators like that would have a point. I mean, at face value, judge not that you be not judged, it would seem like Jesus is sort of making a, 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 a condemnation of condemnation, uh, forbidding all moral judgments or moral assessments. And for some people, uh, some Christians, who've had the Christian story explained to them in a certain way, that Jesus could be putting a judgment on all judgment sort of makes sense to some people, the way the Christian story has been presented to them. Now, that interpretation of this first verse, kind of the theme verse of the passage, uh, which we will see is lacking, is not one that we'd probably find around a new hillside. And that's because here in this church, with this strong emphasis that we have on following King Jesus in every area of life, even the challenging ones, uh, like sex, and the way we use power, and the way we use our money, uh, like Pastor Wayne, a uh, preached so excellently on last week. Uh, we, we understand that grace, God's favor, has a very particular goal. And we understand that grace, as wonderful as it is, that God has uh, these oceans of favor and mercy towards us, that grace means what it means within a very particular story, the big story of the Bible. Grace has a shape, and the shape is the whole story of the Bible and what God is trying to do in creation and through our redemption. And that's why, by the way, to digress just for a moment, if in the future God allows us to do what I'm dreaming about, which is to do a complete remodel of our downstairs, total remodel, turning it into our dream children's and youth ministry venue, okay, one that is the best for miles around, okay, if God allows us to do that, I am hoping that some of the design elements will convey the big story of the Bible, from God creating us in love in Genesis to God redeeming all of creation in the future. And so I'm hoping that over the years, as are our kids, who are our most precious ones, right? As they, they go down there and they listen to lessons and they sing uh, with Peter Anderson leading them on guitar and they play games and they do crafts and they meet in small groups uh, with children's ministry team members shepherding them and caring for them. I'm hoping that as they, over year after year, as they experience ministry down there, they will begin to see Christianity less as a set of doctrines to ascribe to, though the doctrines are true and important, but less a series of abstract doctrines and more a story <laughs> to live as a participant, as an actor, as someone who has a role to play, but I digress. You see, here at New Hillside, we're not likely to read verse one as a whatever goes statement. That's probably not us, because we understand that the gospel, which from a technical standpoint is Jesus, the full career of Jesus from his preexistence all the way through his perfect life and his death for sin and his ascension to the Father and his pouring out of the Holy Spirit and his return to come, return in glory, that, 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 that story with special emphasis on the fact that he's king right now, this is his world, the gospel, is directed to our complete restoration. 
That's its goal to turn us into brand new people, to turn us into the people that God imagined we would be when he made us. It's, it's, it's geared to our inside out renewal so that we just shine with God-likeness or to use language from this series, our teleos transformation. And we understand here at this church that our forgiveness, it just does, it doesn't serve no reason. We're not forgiven just to do whatever we wanna do after we're forgiven, right? Forgiveness has a shape. And what forgiveness does is it allows us to begin to live into what God's original purposes were for us when he made us, which is to, to represent him. Uh, to be, we used this language back about a year ago, uh, to diffuse his goodness wherever we go, all over the globe. To be his mini-me's, you could say. Uh, his, his icons, living and breathing his self and purposes wherever we go, all right? Now, over and above those sort of big story of the Bible considerations, that framing, which we have to keep in mind if we're gonna understand this tricky verse. Uh, there are two reasons in the passage itself that would lead us away from thinking that Jesus is just making a judgment on all judgment. Here's the first one. Notice the word brother in verse four. It says, he says, or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye. Brother here means something particular. It, it doesn't just mean any other human being. Brother means fellow disciple. Brother means uh, a fellow hiker on the new creation quest. We are brothers and sisters to each other because we belong to Jesus the King and we're all on a journey together as a church. And so because Jesus is really zeroing in on brothers and sisters, the family of God, this teaching is, is not so much directed to everybody everywhere. It's directed to our internal relationships. He's talking about the family of God and how we relate to each other, how we relate to each other in our Kairos small group, how we relate to each other on the Oasis leadership team, how we relate to each other as a hillside staff, all right? or the Turi home group. Second reason, right here in the passage, that makes it very clear Jesus is not making a condemnation on all condemnation. Look at the last verse of the passage, verse six. Some say this is the most uh, difficult passage in the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to what Jesus says. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you, okay? Not, not surprising, people would find this a little bit, bit of a head scratcher, okay? We're not gonna to spend too much time trying to figure out what it means other than to point out that what Jesus is calling us to do in this passage actually requires something like judging, something like making an assessment of some sort. After all, in order to know whom not to give what is holy, whatever that might mean, one's gotta make a judgment. One has to exercise our, our moral reasoning and make some kind of decision. And there are lots of examples that we could cite in Matthew to show that obeying Jesus, living the way he wants us to live, requires something like making a moral assessment of some kind, using our, our spirit-empowered critical factories to think about what's right and wrong, though always in a generous way. In fact, when Pastor Wayne and I were talking about this sermon just this last week, he said, oh yeah, I was just reading a passage in Romans. <laughs> Uh, abhor what is evil, Paul tells us, right? Well, what does that require by definition? Some kind of assessment where we think, right? But always in a generous, generous way. So Noah's spending a lot of time on this, but this verse is often rolled out to mean something that it doesn't mean. <laughs> that Jesus really doesn't care about how we live or doesn't really care about goodness, righteousness, uh, a God-pleasing life, that's just not uh, what it means. And if that is what it means, that we would, we would have huge contradictions even in these six verses. So what does the passage mean? What does the, the passage mean? Here's the big idea this morning. Any input or feedback that we offer to a Christian brother or sister, somebody with whom we're in spiritual companionship, something that we're gonna call for this morning spec extraction to use Jesus's imagery. It's gotta have three flavors. And here's the first one. We're gonna take them one by one. Speck extraction must be gentle. I mean, really gentle. 
There is no doubt that as believers, we are called to speak into each other's lives. We're, we're not like other communities. We're involved with each other. We have relationships with each other. We share our lives with each other. And we talk about our lives with each other. So spec extraction forms a part of those rich relationships. I've, I had a, 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 a council member recently who I love and who loves me gently say to me about two weeks ago, I think this is a growth area for you. You're probably wondering, what came before that? I'm not going to tell you, okay? And Becky was right. <laughs> in fact, in the book of Ephesians, Paul says that, that one of the main ways that we are to grow up together is, is to speak the truth in love to each other. And as Christians, we believe the truth is our friend. The truth is not our enemy. Knowing the truth, knowing the truth about reality, about the way things really are, uh, the shape that God has given the world, both the, uh, the visible shape and the invisible shape. Knowing the truth about ourselves, it sets us free. Jesus says that, the truth sets us free. The truth is indispensable for our flourishing. And by contrast, self-deception, walking around, not knowing what's real, and not knowing what's real about ourselves is anti-flourishing. But having said that, there's no act of Christian love within the family, people who love each other, who are for each other, that requires more care and more kindness and more gentleness and more tenderness. And this is because we're all sensitive. We're all fragile. We're easily hurt. We're easily bruised. We're easily embarrassed. We're easily shamed. And if we deny it, we're dirty, rotten liars. That's what I think. We're sensitive unless we're a robot. I hear they're coming, okay? Uh, they won't be sensitive. We can say whatever we want to say to them before they shoot us with the ray gun or whatever they're gonna do. I hope not. Anyway. And so therefore, when we speak uh, into each other's lives as fellow, as fellow disciples, we just do it with the utmost gentleness. We do it with, with tenderness. And here's the thing. If we cannot do it in a way that does not leave our friend a smoking crater, <laughs> we don't do it at all. The way we share is by simply modeling something different in our own lives. We just pray for that friend. So what's the first thing we learned here about spec extraction? This has got to be so gentle. I mean, so gentle. It's important. We talk to each other. It's got to be gentle. Second, spec extraction has got to be helpful. And the, the, the motivation behind any gentle input that we offer to a spiritual companion, it should be her, for her betterment, for, for her building up. So she feels better too, has greater capabilities. You know, one of the great, benefit to being a pastor in the Evangelical Covenant Church, which is our denomination here at New Hillside. A denomination, by the way, that I truly love. It is, it's a gift to be a part of this denomination. It's really tremendous. But one of the great gifts uh, for being a pastor in the denomination is you get to have a pastoral mentor. And in the covenant, there's this program called RGR, Ro Rooted Growing Resilient. You couldn't have this if you were in a church kind of outside a big network in which pastors can be matched with other pastors that help refine them. And this is just a value in the covenant, right? We're better together, We're always helping each other get better. Well, my pastoral mentor is a giant in the Evangelical Covenant Church. His name is Art Greco. I think he's gonna come up here. There he is. And he was the pastor of Marin Covenant Church uh, for many years. I think he's preached here a few times. Um, but Will Davidson, our Better Together leader, calls Art Greco one of the most respected pastors in the covenant. And I'm very grateful to have his coaching. And recently in a Zoom meeting, Art gave me very, very specific input. He's very astute. <laughs> and uh, he told me something about leadership and love. And I think he, we've talked a lot, and I think he, astute, probably picked up certain things in me, certain specks in the eye, and very gently he talked to me about it. 
And what's really interesting um, is that in addition, again, to being gentle, I mean, he's just so gentle. He, he's kind of a tough Greek guy, but he's gentle. He really loves me. He's really for me. Loves our church, by the way. His input was helpful. He was helpful. He wants me to grow. He wants me to be as fruitful as I can possibly be. Speck extraction is about building up. It's not about shaming other people. It, it's not about score settling. And finally, here's the most important one. Speck extraction must be self-aware. And this is the one, the flavor I think is the most interesting one. This is really a rich idea. Look back at the passage starting at verse three. It says, why do you see the speck that's in your own brother's eye? That's in your, in your brother's eye. But do not notice the log that's in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And here Jesus paints a hilarious picture, doesn't he? If we just sort of take it in and imagine, it's funny. It's of a dude with this huge wooden beam uh, sticking out of his eye trying to dab out the wood chip or speck of, of, of some other guy. And what's interesting is here we have imagery from the carpentry shop, don't we? Jesus grew up the son of a carpenter. I mean, who knows, maybe at one point, you know, while he's uh, holding a board or assisting uh, you know, a senior carpenter guy you know, doing some, some sawing, maybe a little speck flew into Jesus' eye and, and he drew on that for his teaching, I don't know. But Jesus' point is plain, self-awareness, self-knowledge. Any chip removal that we dare attempt on a brother or sister ought to be massively mindful of our own eye logs. Massively. Otherwise, it's insufferable. You see, self-awareness, self-knowledge, always, in every case, there are no exceptions, translates into humility. It translates into mercy. Because if we're really self-aware, if we really know ourselves like the butler knows us, <laughs> they used to say, we're humble by definition. We walk low to the ground if we really know ourselves. Because to be self-aware is to be aware of our many flaws, to be aware of our many weaknesses, our many growth areas, our profound need for God's mercy every single day. And that awareness has a, a, a moderating effect on any input that we consider giving anyone. It softens it. It, it seasons it with, with grace, with, with generosity. And we could put it this way. Input absent self-awareness is insufferable. Ineffective and nobody wants it or could take it. On the other hand, input soaked in self-awareness, it can actually be sweet or at least it can be palatable to our Christian friend rather than simply repulsive. That raises a question, you know, how do we actually grow in self-awareness? How, how can we know each, ourselves better than we do now? We'll never know each other perfectly. Only God knows us perfectly. But how do we grow in self-awareness? Self-awareness is elusive again. In the same way that we, we literally cannot see ourselves. The only way we can see ourselves is through a mirror, okay? Unless we have uh, eyes that pop out of our head and turn back like something uh, in, a, in a creepy movie. Unless we have that, we can't see ourselves. And, and I was reminded of that when, when Peter Nittler did his imitation of me. <laughs> I thought, that's me? It was. There are ways to identify our own eye beams. There are ways growing in self-knowledge, kind of knowing more about our own tangles, our own tendencies, our own habits, interrelational and otherwise, that blunt our effectiveness as agents of the king, which is what we are as Christians. And first we look for patterns. Let, notice the word notice in verse three. Notice. For instance, if we notice that certain conflicts keep coming up, over and over again. It might indicate a beam in the eye. Maybe we're the common denominator. If it's something there that Jesus wants to iron out of us. 
Another way to grow in self-knowledge involves something that we talked about about three weeks ago in the message on private prayer, room of riches prayer. And you might remember that step three of that prayer pattern was confess with specificity. Number three, and with that third step of this prayer pattern, we just look back over the last 24 hours of our lives with Jesus right next to us, the one who loves us, our shepherd, our Lord, our master, our friend. And together with Jesus, we look back over the last 24 hours and we allow him in the power of the spirit to bring to our attention just ways we missed the mark. Insensitive things we said, uh, old habits we indulged in, whatever it happens to be. Opportunity to do something good, we didn't do it. And then we confess those things. We confess them and then we enjoy the pardon. But what happens is we regularly practice confession, naming specifics, we'll begin to notice patterns. And then we will have indications of areas of our character that Jesus who loves us would, would like to refine. And what happens is, is that awareness, growing awareness of really who we are, it leads to humility. It leads to a different way of being in the world. It leads to compassion for others. And it leads to just a more generous style of communication, a more generous way of being with people in general. Let, let's close with this. I was thinking about this this past week. You know, Jesus' teaching here really has parenting implications. It has lots of different implications, but I was thinking about this. It has parenting implications. And the reason it has parenting implications is that part of uh, faithful parenting, it, it requires, especially with, with kids who have not left the home yet, it requires something like speck extraction from our kids. And the reason for that is because part of our job, God gave us the kids that he gave us really so that we could raise them to love God, to know God to be formed by him and to exemplify his character, which of course is the best thing for them, right? Because to be deeply Jesus-like is to be a person of joy and peace and tremendous power and the capacity for a healthy, joyful relationship in the future, right? Character is far more important in kids than their SAT scores, which from what I hear don't matter anyway, anymore, okay? <laughs> Character's destiny. But to do that requires some speck extraction. But to be effective, it's got to be so gentle. It's got to be so helpful. It's got to be so self-aware. And maybe we aspire to do it this way. We put our arms around our kid. And I want you to know I'm talking to myself here. Because <laughs> I told Pastor Wayne about a week ago, I just utterly blew this recently. <laughs> Still in school. But this is what I aspire to do when I'm in these situations. I love you so much. I am so proud. And as your dad who loves you, um, you know, and as someone who has huge areas that Jesus the King is still trying to shape me in, I want to share with you about an area where I think King Jesus might want to shape you so that you can fulfill all the exciting purposes for which God created you. And I wonder, would, would, would coaching like that lead to something more, some more responsiveness from our kids? Would it lead to, to more responsiveness maybe from our adult kids for whom we are always parents still? I got an idea, let's do this. If you are the parent of a kid or a teen, and you're in the thick of this, we wanna pray for you as a church family. We're not all in this spot. But if you're that person, would you stand up so the rest of us can pray for you? Because you're in the thick of this. And then the rest of it will do what Gary's doing. We're gonna, we're gonna pray with our hands out to these parents. Father, as a family, we lift up to you all the people in this church, our fellow hikers 
who have kids in their home and are trying as you give them strength and wisdom to raise them in your son. And give them the ability to balance that responsibility with the ones they have outside the home. Like 40 hours a week as teachers, people working in the corporate world, CPAs, nurse practitioners, people with long commutes. Make them gentle, make them helpful, make them self-aware in the words of instruction and coaching they give to their kids. And as they do, may you open the hearts of their kids to respond to that loving wisdom so they can grow up in you and be fully alive. Father, thank you for your son whose life, death for our sins and resurrection makes new lives possible, lives of becoming whole. Thank you. And we pray in your son's name. Amen.